everybody, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We have had a wonderful time this week celebrating the birth of our Savior, and we are looking forward to continuing that tonight. If you'd stand with me.
Father, tonight on this Wednesday evening, Lord, we do give you praise and honor and adoration. Lord, we're so grateful for Christmas. And Lord, I know the world doesn't celebrate it for the right reason, but Jesus is the reason for the season. Lord, tonight, Father, it's because you came as a babe in a manger. And Lord, because you paid the price that man could not afford to pay but must and had to pay, God, you took our penalty upon yourself. And Lord, that's the reason we have hope for eternity and hope during our life on this planet and yet beyond the grave. Lord, tonight I pray, God, that you would just be with us in this service. I pray, Lord, that as we continue to just set in your presence and bask in your glory, that, Lord, you would touch us afresh with your anointing. I pray, Lord, you would work miracles in this house tonight. God, we haven't come just to play church. We've come to meet you. God, we haven't come to waste time. We've come to spend it with you. And Lord, tonight I pray, God, not one person would walk out the way they walked in, but I pray they'd be encouraged, uplifted, and strengthened in the inner man. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before you sit down, greet somebody and let them know you're glad they're in God's house. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. We welcome you to the house of the Lord tonight. Can you believe that we're going to be celebrating Christmas in just a couple days? Awesome. Amen. And I know a lot of people are making plans. Some are out of town. But are you glad you're in God's house tonight? I'd rather be here than any place else. You know, Christmas was always one of those times of the season as a, a little boy growing up in the preacher's home that there was a lot of excitement going on in the church. There was always excitement in the church, but Christmas, it was a special time, and uh, we didn't want to miss going to church, especially during the Christmas season, and I'm glad you're here tonight because there's no better place to be than in God's house on a Wednesday night this time of year, amen. Just a couple of announcements before we get into the word. Uh, next week on Wednesday night, there will be no midweek Bible study. We will be having on Friday night next week our New Year's Eve service. And what we're doing with that, we're asking you all to bring a dish to pass. It's soup and sandwich night. And uh, we started off doing that. And uh, when we first came, that's been a tradition that I've had in the churches I've pastored on New Year's Eve, a soup and sandwich, just a simple meal. And uh, we're going to get together in fellowship, and we're going to have a great evening. It's going to be kind of a, just a, a relaxed atmosphere. And on uh, Friday night, on New Year's Eve, I will announce our theme for next year. You will hear Pastor Brendan share a little bit what's on his heart on uh, that evening. And uh, uh, you're going to have an end-of-the-year video, and it's just going to be a great time. So mark that down. Next week is... Uh, is uh, New Year's Eve service already. Praise God. And I think that's all the announcements other than the fact that if you have to miss one Sunday, you don't want to miss this Sunday. Why? It's the last Sunday of the year. And uh, I guarantee you'll want to be a part of it. Hallelujah. It's 6 o'clock. Yep, 6 o'clock on New Year's Eve service. Amen. Praise God. We're going to turn to Isaiah again tonight. Last week we were in Isaiah 9. Tonight I want to go backward. I want to go to Isaiah chapter 7. And again, we're going to deal with one verse. Very, very familiar, but I want to... Actually, I'm going to read a few verses. I want to start at verse 10 and read through verse 14. The Bible said, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore, 
the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Amen. Father, tonight, Lord, as we endeavor to dissect this passage, I pray, God, that, Lord, we would exegete it correctly and properly, and, Lord, that, God, people would understand the context of the text tonight, and, Lord, the message of the hour would reach a heart that's hungry to hear from you. And, Lord, I pray, God, that you would confirm your word with signs following in Jesus' name. Amen. We often quote the 14th verse, but often we don't understand the context of it. The Bible said in verse 14, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And whenever you see the word therefore in a verse, you got to go to the previous verses to see why that verse is being written. And what is happening in the context of Isaiah chapter 7 is Israel and Syria are joining forces to come against Judah. King Ahaz is the king of Judah and his heart's filled with fear. And God promises him that everything's going to be all right. In the first several verses through Isaiah, God tells Ahaz, everything's going to be all right. And then he tells him in verse number 7, or, or verse number 10 rather, Moreover, the Lord spake again to Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord God. I want to ask you a question tonight. We'll have a little interaction. Is it right or wrong to seek for a sign or expect a sign from God? You know, I've heard preachers tell me that fleeces are not of God. They were in the Old Testament, but they don't happen in the New Testament and... Uh, they're really not biblical. How many have ever heard that? You've heard that, Rick? Yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it through the years. But I want to ask, is it right or wrong to seek for a sign or expect a sign from God? I hear right. Do I hear any wrongs? No wrongs. Everybody's all right. Amen. Amen. Well, the answer is this. The answer, it's both. It may be right, and it may be wrong. You say, how can it be wrong to seek a sign from God? Well, it depends on the motivation behind the seeking of the sign. Amen? You see, in our text, God tells Ahaz, I want you to know that I'm going to take care of you. Therefore, ask me a sign. Ask me for a sign. And what does Ahaz say? No, I'm not going to tempt God because what does the Bible say? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, right? And it appears like Ahaz is being spiritual, but a number of the commentators point out the fact that perhaps he had already had an allegiance with Assyria to help him go against the other two, but he, he wasn't going to ask God for a sign. And that's why Isaiah said to him, Hear ye now, our house, our house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? God has told you to ask for a sign, and you're saying, I'm not going to ask for a sign. Because I'm not going to tempt God. Well, if God's told you to ask for a sign, by all means, ask for a sign. Ahaz is attempting to come across looking spiritual. But I want you to know it's not wrong to ask for a sign in some cases, but there are times it is wrong to ask for a sign. When it's fueled by doubt, unbelief, and cynicism, it's wrong to ask for a sign. Mark chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. 
And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. You see, they were coming to test him. They were coming to tempt him. They were, they were not looking for an answer. They were trying to just disprove him. And when you come with an attitude of, I'm going to prove God wrong, God's not going to have it. That's a wrong motivation for asking for a sign. In John chapter 2, in verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? They're asking a sign. Go on to 1 Corinthians 1 and 22. The Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Amen? The Jews require a sign. Why? Because they have no faith. When you don't have faith, you have to get a sign. But the Bible said in Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 6 that without faith, it is what? Impossible. There's no way you can please God without faith. Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Amen? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And when they were asking for a sign, Jesus, the Bible said, he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And they were asking a sign because they didn't have faith. Go to John chapter 20 and verse 29. Jesus saith unto Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. Amen? Thomas said, I won't believe unless I have a sign. I won't believe until you prove it to me. And Jesus came and did that, but he said unto Thomas, you know, you believe because you, you saw the sign, but... I like it when you believe even without the sign. We need to get to a place in our Christian walk where we don't need the sign. It doesn't mean we don't want a sign, but we don't need the sign. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when is, when is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. He said it's a wicked and adulterous nation that seeks a sign. Why? Because they're not operating in faith. And whatever is not of faith is sin. God tells Ahaz, ask me a sign. Ahaz said, no, I won't tempt God. His motive was not, not to tempt God. There was other motivation behind it. Because in this case, God's the one that initiated the sign seeking. But there are times in our life where asking a sign is a sign of, in our life of lack of faith. Amen? So there can be times in our life where it's not right to ask for a sign. If our motivation is to prove God wrong or if we're full of unbelief and cynicism, it's wrong to ask for a sign. That's tempting God. And thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Wasn't it the thief on the cross that wanted a sign? If you're really God, come off the cross and save yourself and save us while you're at it. He was tempting God. It 
was wrong for him to ask for that sign because his motivation was impure and incorrect. So I'm asking the, the question tonight, is it wrong to uh, seek a sign? It depends on your motive. When is it right to seek a sign? And we're not going to be too long tonight. We're probably going to get out a little early. But that's all right on Christmas week. Amen? When is it right to ask for a sign? When you need to confirm your faith or confirm the will of God, it's good to ask for a sign. Exodus chapter 4 and verses 1 through 9, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand in thy bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put it into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, Neither hearken unto thy voice that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. God, Moses is saying, God, when God called Moses, he's saying, when I go to the people of Israel and say, God has sent me, they're going to say, who sent you? God said, you tell them I am that I am. And Moses said, they're not going to believe that. God said, I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to give you a sign to confirm the call. There are times God confirms his call with signs and wonders. Amen? In Judges chapter 6 and verses 36 to 40, Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry on the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morning and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece and upon, or let it be dry only on the fleece and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only and there was dew on the ground. Gideon is saying, God, if you've called me, I need to prove all things. I need to know that I know that I know that it's you. And so if it's you, I'm going to put a fleece out. And the first time he said, let the fleece be wet and let the ground be dry. And God let that happen. He said, I want another test. In the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established. If the ground is dry and if, if the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, then I'll know that you sent me. Has there ever been a time in your life where you needed to know that you knew it was God? When I prayed about getting married to Jennifer, I said to the Lord, I said, God, I fasted for six for seven weeks. Five days the first week and two days a week for the next six weeks. And my prayer was this. I said, God, I'm vulnerable. I'm just coming out 
of a divorce situation and I know that I'm weak. But you promised me that if I asked fish, you wouldn't give me a serpent and if I asked bread, you wouldn't give me a stone. So I'm asking you right now that if this is not your will, you take any desire in my heart for her away. And if it is your will, then you put a desire in her heart to want to be with me. And I put the fleece out to the Lord and I prayed and I fasted for those weeks and God answered those fleeces with, with confer, confirmation of signs following. And when we prayed about getting married, God spoke to me on one occasion. I was preaching in Little Falls as an evangelist before I took the church. And uh, it was a Sunday night at the beginning of the crusade. I was there Sunday to Wednesday and I went to one of the rooms on the side of the platform and I was praying before the service and God said to me, he said, I want you to give so much money to Jennifer. I, she didn't know me. I didn't really know her. But God said, I want you to give her this amount of money and I don't want you to let her know where it came from. Give it to your brother, her pastor, and give it anonymously. And I said, I'm not giving money to her, let alone that amount. God said, you give her that amount of money and you give it anonymously. Well, when Jennifer came to Christ, she stopped dating and she was asking God to bring her husband into her life without the dating scene. And we compared notes later, but on the very night that I had been told by God to give her money, she was at home in her apartment praying, God, send my husband to bless me with money. She was waiting for God to send the right man. Now, we laugh about it, but she had had a crush on a guy in her previous church, and she thought he was going to come over that night and give her some money. And lo and behold, it wasn't this guy she had the crush on. It was me. But I didn't take the money. I'd given it to my brother who delivered it to her and just gave it to her anonymously. But there was a sign given. Amen? And then later, my brother was preaching, and on a Sunday morning, he said, if you need a word from God, come on up to the altar and talk to him. And she went up to the altar that Sunday, and she was praying about going back to where she came from and going back to college. She had her bachelor's degree but was praying about going back for her master's. And as she was praying, and she didn't know me except I was her pastor's brother and evangelist, and, and uh, so she started to pray about going back to school. God said, give up your plans and you go in the ministry with Joe. She said, this can't be God. So she was at a conference up in Albany, New York, and while they were there, it was the last night of the conference, and she was praying, and a couple of women came over to her and, and uh, started to pray with her, and, and uh, in her mind, not out loud, but in her mind, she was saying, God, I need a yes or no. I need an answer from you. I need a, I need a fleece here to be, to be sure, because... I don't know about this. I don't know that it's your will. She said, so I need a yes or no. Never said a word out loud. And the one lady said to her, said, don't tell me what you want prayer for. She said, you're asking God for a yes or no. And God says, yes. And there was the answer to the fleece. Amen. And God had spoken to my heart different things and uh, showed me different things. And, uh, and we knew it was God because God had answered a couple of fleeces. And there are times where before you jump into something, you better know that you know that you know that you've heard from heaven. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Sometimes we need proof, amen? We need to prove that it's God or not. And that's what Gideon was doing in our in, in uh, Judges chapter 6. He was saying, God, if it's you really speaking to me to go against the Midianites and defeat them, then I need proof. And so he put out the fleece before God, and he asked, he asked for a sign. 
In Luke chapter 2 and verse 12, the Bible says, And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Here's your proof, amen? Because I want to ask you now, what is a sign? When he said, behold, I'll give you a sign, a virgin will conceive. And he asked, told Ahaz, ask for a sign. What is a sign? Something that is not natural. What's that? An indicator. I have written on my paper, miraculous proof. Amen? Miraculous proof. I preached a sermon of several years ago on a fresh Pentecost, seeing the signs, witnessing the wonders, and ministering the miraculous. And I dissected those three words, signs, wonders, and miracles. And how many know they're all different? Jesus of Nazareth, a man to approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. God did miracles, wonders, and signs. What's a wonder? It means too high, too high. It makes you wonder. A wonder makes you wonder. It's like a word of knowledge. How did he know that? How did that happen? That's a wonder. These, uh, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me in Psalm 39. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. You're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, Lord, thou knowest it all together. You know, thou hast beset me before and behind and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonder for me it is high I cannot attain unto it how do you know that about me you've laid your hand on me you know me inside and outside and upside and downside you know all about me I can't fathom that that's wondrous to me when God uses someone in a word of knowledge you often say how did they know that that's a wonder a miracle is a supernatural act that breaks the laws of nature. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Amen? And then a sign is a miraculous proof. It is a declaration that this is from God. How many know that God is a sign God? We serve a sign God, a God of signs and not the exit signs. We need more signs and wonders in the church than the exit signs and people wondering why the pastor preaches so long. We need miracles and we need wonders back in the church, but it's evidence. When I'm hunting for deer, I'm looking for sign that there's deer in the woods where I'm hunting. I want to see if there's scat, I want to see if there's rubs. I want to see if there's scrapes. I want to see if there's bucks in the area. What do I do? I look for deer sign. Evidence that there are deer in the area. When I look for signs from God, that is evidence that God is in the area. Amen? We need some signs back in the church to say God is in the house. God is in this place. Amen? We need supernatural evidence to, pr pr to uh, prove that God is in this place. Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, and these signs shall follow them that believe. These are proofs that you're a believer. How many believers are in the house? It doesn't say these signs will follow the pastor, the evangelist, the preacher. No, it said these signs will follow them that believe. If you're a believer, these signs will follow you. These signs are proof that you are a believer. In my name you will cast out devils. That's a sign. 
When you begin to cast demons out, Dave over in Africa, when you begin to cast demons out, that's a sign you were a believer. When Paul met the girl with the spirit of divination making money for her, for her uh, bosses, so to speak, those that controlled her, Paul cast the devil out of her. There's your sign that Paul was a believer. Amen? That was a sign. In my name, you'll cast out devils. How many know you don't have to be afraid of the devil? God's a sign, God. In my name, you'll cast out devils. In my name, you will do what? What's next in that verse? Speak with new tongues. Tell me that the baptism of the Holy Ghost isn't for everybody. If you're a believer, one of the signs is one of the supernatural proofs. It's not the only one, but one of the supernatural proofs that you're a believer is that you will speak with new tongues. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? You have to be a believer in order to receive the Holy Ghost. Amen? And this is one of the signs that you're a believer. On the day of Pentecost, they heard them speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the, gave the utterance. That was a sign that they were believers. Here's your sign. Remember that? Here's your sign. Here's your sign that I'm a believer. I've cast out demons. I speak with new tongues. You take up serpents. And that doesn't mean that you'll be a snake handler. I know that there's some nutcases down in the south that believe in pulling out rattlesnakes. That's thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's just idiotic. Remember when Paul was in the boat and the storm came up and they capsized? They got to shore and Paul built a fire and he had sticks in his hands and he was going to throw them on the fire, but out of the sticks, out of the bundle of sticks, there came a poisonous viper and it bit him. And those around him said, he's done something wrong that that viper bit him. He's going to die. But when there was nothing wrong with him, they said, this guy must be a god. It was a sign to them that he had something that they didn't have. Amen. In my name, when it says take up, actually in the Greek it means put out. To take up or to put out is what it means in the Greek. In my name you will put out demons. In my name you will put out serpents. In my name you will put out You'll take up serpents and, you, and they will not hurt you. You'll drink, you. You'll drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you, amen? And then it says, in my name you shall do what? Lay hands on the sick and they'll get sicker. In my name, if you're a believer, you will lay hands on the sick and they shall you don't have to wait for the pastor to come visit you to lay hands on your loved one. Lay your hands on them yourself. Believe God for miracles. God is a sign, God. This is a sign. This is a proof. This is supernatural evidence that you are a believer. In my name, you'll cast out devils. You'll speak with new tongues. You'll take up serpents. And if you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. In my name, you'll lay hands on the sick and they shall get better. They will recover. There's your sign. Exodus chapter 7 through 10 was another sign. Not only sign your believer, but a sign of God's judgment. Sometimes signs are given to prove that God means what he said. Remember the 10 plagues? Here you go, Pharaoh. If you want to know that it's God, watch this. What's interesting is the magicians did nine of the plagues as well as God. But the tenth plague they couldn't handle. Amen? 
God was using those plagues as signs to get Pharaoh's attention. Sometimes God uses signs as proof that he's God and that he's wanting to get our attention. In Matthew 11 and verses 1 through 5, and it came to pass when Jesus had made, made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teaching to preach in their cities. Now when John heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. John is in prison. He heard about this miracle worker from Galilee, and he sends word with a couple of his own disciples and asks him, is he Messiah or are we looking for somebody else? And what did Jesus say? Here's your sign. Here are the miracles to prove that I am Messiah. I am the one you're to look for. I am the one that is coming in the name of Christ, in the name of my Father. The Bible said in verse 14, and thou, and the Lord himself will give you a sign. You're not going to ask a sign, I'm going to give you a sign. What is the sign? It's a supernatural indication, a supernatural proof, a supernatural evidence, and the sign is this, behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. How many know it's miraculous when a virgin has a baby? Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. What was it proof of? What was it evidence of? What was this a sign of? The deity of Christ. Emmanuel, God with us. When we celebrate Christmas, and we talk about the birth of a babe in a manger, we're talking about God in the flesh. And this is proof that Jesus is God. This is where a lot of religions, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, and many others, will not declare that Jesus is God. They'll say he's a prophet, he was a good man, but they will not say he was God. That's how you tell if they are truly following Christ or not. If they'll confess that Christ has come in the flesh and that Jesus is Lord, amen? Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I and my Father are one, amen? And here's the sign that Jesus is God. He's going to be born of a virgin, Behold, a virgin will conceive. Why a virgin? Well, two reasons. Number one, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. How many know that God confirms his word with signs following? You read Mark 16, 20, amen? The Lord working with them, confirming his word with signs following. That's what a sign is. It is a confirmation. It is a proof. It is an evidence. And God always confirms his word. Genesis 3.15 says what? The curse on, on, on the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice how it says her seed. Not his seed, but her seed. God prophesied that this would happen. The reason a virgin conceived and bore a son was a virgin was not contaminated with the bloodline of a human male. And lineage was always determined by the man. Luke 2 and verse 4. 
The Bible said, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was in the, of the house and lineage of David. Amen? It wasn't a woman that he was found in the lineage of. It was the man he was found in the lineage of. The line always came down through the man. But notice Genesis 3 said it's going to be her seed, not the man's seed, not the man's lineage, the woman's lineage. Why? Because she had never been with a man. And it was a, a fulfillment of a prophetic word, and it was so that Jesus could be uncontaminated by sin of man so he could fulfill the call on his life, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that it wasn't possible that the blood of bulls and goats take away sin, but it was the spotless lamb, Jesus, that took our sin. That's why he was born of a virgin. I never would have had him born of a virgin. I said it before. I want people to believe in Jesus. Why would I deliver him in such an unbelievable way? Having Mary become pregnant seems to me like loading a semi-truck full of priceless goods at the top of a mountain that is ice-covered with no guardrails and sending that truck down that hill. You're jeopardizing the merchandise. You're jeopardizing Jesus. Who's going to believe on Jesus when you tell a story that's so unbelievable, it was a virgin that was his mother. How can I believe in him if I can't believe that? Why would God use a virgin? He knew what he was doing. How many understood also that Mary's life was in jeopardy? Here she's saying, I've never been with a man. Right, lady. And if you've been with a man, Joseph can put you away. And if you've been with a man you're not married to, what about the woman caught in adultery? What'd they say to do with her? Stone her to death. So we're putting Mary on the line. We're putting Jesus on the line by having him born of a virgin. But that was the sign because a, a virgin, a woman who'd never been with a man, could not physically give birth to a child. But that's the supernatural proof that Jesus is God. A virgin conceived and bore a son, and they called his name Emmanuel. They called his name Jesus. Amen. God with us. Amen. And so God says to Ahaz, the Lord himself will give you a sign, and I'm going to give you a sign to prove that my son is God. And this Christmas, as we come to celebrate the birth of the Christ child, don't ever forget who we're worshiping when we come around the manger scene. We're worshiping God. We're not worshiping just a baby. Oh, that, that plays up cute in the movies. But that's not what it's about. It's not about a baby as much as it's about deity. It's about God. And to show you that he is God, I'll let him come through the womb of a woman that's never been with a man. Here's your sign. How many believe that God's a sign God this Christmas season? How many believe that God works supernaturally to prove his word to be true? How many need God to prove himself to you tonight? We need to be able to come to a place where we take him by faith. But there's also times where we are invited to prove that he's God. And I want to pray as we close the service out tonight for anybody that has a situation you're facing. You just, I need to know God's in this. I need to know that God is working in this situation. I believe he's working, but I would like some proof. And I'm going to pray for God to confirm his word with signs following tonight. If that's you, I just want you to lift your hand. I don't want you to tell me your problems or any of your burdens. But if you need God to intervene in a situation in your life, just lift your hand up. 
Let's begin to believe God as a sign God, a miracle working God. He's, he's a supernatural God. Christmas is supernatural. Christmas is not normal. And whatever your need is tonight, let's believe God that he will step into your situation and he'll reveal himself to you tonight. Father, the Bible said if two agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done. And Lord, for those viewing by live stream as well as those in this auditorium, God, whatever situation they may be facing that is bigger than they are, God, I'm asking, Lord, that you would step into that circumstance right now. And God, you would begin to reveal yourself as the great I am. That you would show yourself as the God that is more than enough, El Shaddai. The God that is bigger than all our cares. The God that's able to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond all we are able to ask or think. Lord, for those that need healing in their body, I pray, Lord, you would be the healer. For those that need direction, I pray, God, you would be, Lord, the instructor and the director of their paths. God, for those that, Lord, need encouragement, I pray you would be the lifter of their head. And I pray, God, tonight, Lord, that you would step into circumstances that seem impossible. And I pray, God, you would bring the possible out of the impossible. I pray, God, that you would call those things that are not as though they are. And God, I pray, Lord, you would prove yourself to be God in situations that are far bigger than our capacity as humankind to meet. God, your will be done on this Wednesday night. And Lord, as we approach Christmas on Saturday, let somebody receive a gift from you that would boggle their mind and just, just encourage them beyond words. And Lord, I pray for signs and wonders this season and I ask it in the name of Jesus and for your glory alone, amen, amen, praise God, amen. God bless you tonight. I know it's early, but we're gonna, we're gonna turn you loose. Amen. You may go over and crash the young people's party if you want. They might let you in. Amen. Or you, you can go to your homes, but we're going to turn you loose tonight. Amen. Just a short little devotional to get you thinking. God is a sign God. When God invites you to prove, prove him. Don't do it for wrong motives. Don't do it to tempt him. Don't do it to test him. But do it to confirm his word. Amen? God is a God of signs and wonders and miracles this season. God bless you.